Here are two number nine set trucks with their trolley bus aerials erected, going out to provide a link between two headquarters. Each truck carries a full crew of four operators and one electrician. On arrival at their destination, they will have to erect ground stations. The crew with numbers is Detachment A, and they will show the drill. The other crew, whom you'll see later, without numbers, is Detachment B, and they'll show some of the common faults which often occur. The point to observe is that speed is essential, because the most urgent calls on the wireless detachment so often happen when other means of communication have failed. For this reason, a rigid drill must be employed in which the set is closed down for the minimum of time. Here we are on the site. Under cover with that truck. That's right. The driver's job is to camouflage and look after his truck, and numbers one, two, and three unload the aerial equipment, leaving number four to continue operating the set. The mast gear is taken to the site. Number two drives in a peg, which is a marker for the base of the mast. Number one unpacks the feeder, counterpoise, insulator, base plug, and rubber cover. Now here's detachment B. You'll see that they have other ideas. The driver should be attending to his truck, not the aerial bag. Neither have chairs or batteries got anything to do with the erection of the aerial. They won't be needed until the set is reassembled on the ground. What's this? The set? Well, who's going to work it without first getting the aerial up? There's certainly going to be a big delay on the traffic at this rate. The charging engine is the last thing to leave the truck, but maybe they want to get at the primus. Well, now that they have at last decided to put up the aerial, the peg driver should remember to work well away from those assembling the mask gear, or... <coughs> What do you think you're doing? Exactly. In detachment A, notice that number two is keeping a reasonable distance between himself and the men assembling the aerial. He checks up on the wind and takes ten paces to where the first peg goes in. Number three gives a hand with the mast and helps number one to screw on the stay plate two sections from the top. Then number three collects the base plug, insulator and rubber cover screws the base plug to the insulator and fits them all onto the bottom of the mast. The rubber guard goes on first and then the locking nut is tightened. The mast is carried over and laid down in the correct position with its base by the marker peg. The mast should be lifted into the wind. Before laying the stays out, they should be sorted into their correct positions or else there will be a first class tangle. The stays are laid out in the direction of the four pegs over which they're going to slip. The mast is now ready for lifting. Number three steadies the base of the mast, whilst number one lifts it. Number two holds the two windward stays to prevent any sudden gust of wind whipping the mast over while it's being raised. The mast is up and the base plug is given an extra push to make it sit firmly on the ground. Numbers two and three make off the two windward stays. Whilst this is being done, care is taken not to strain the mast or pull it about. When all the stays have been attached to their pegs, number one directs the dressing of the mast. The stays are taken in opposite pairs, and numbers two and three tighten up or slacken off according to instructions from number one. Pull up! A bit more! Well, let's have a look at detachment B and see how they're getting on. One school of thought has it that you should fix the stays over the pegs first, because it's quicker, perhaps. Hey, slacken off those stays! It's surprising how many snags keep cropping up if one does follow this plan. Also, when making off the stays, remember to watch the mast. Look out, or you'll have a broken mast to pay for. The mast is made of thin copper tubing and will not stand rough handling. Meantime, number four in detachment A is trying to contact detachment B, but without success. Next, the remote aerial gear has to be fitted. Numbers one and two bring up the equipment. Number two lays out the feeder and connects the two sections, whilst number one is connecting the unit to the aerial. Then the feeder is clamped to the unit, and last of all, the counterpoise. When the counterpoise has been fanned out, the aerial assembly is complete, and ready to receive the set. Number four is still trying to contact detachment B, but he hasn't much hope.
Gosh, what a stack of uncleared traffic on top of the set. Well, you can't waste any more time. The set's got to come out. Number four unclamps his batteries and passes them out to numbers one and two. And they take them over to the site chosen for the set. They're left close together, ready for connecting. In getting the set out of the truck, extreme care has to be combined with speed. Numbers one and four lift the set forward and pass it out carefully to numbers two and three. Number one hops out and helps number two carry the set onto the site. Numbers three and four stay to collect battery leads, phone, microphone key, and the stationary box. First of all, the batteries must be connected together. Don't forget to connect the leads to the batteries before you close the lids. Then put the set on top. Number three screws the battery plug home. The aerial coupler is plugged in. And then the feeder is connected and clamped on. In order that number three can get away as quickly as possible with the remote control, number four finishes up the rest of the connections. He earths the aerial coupler, plugs in the headphones, and puts the microphone handy for the remote control, which number two is bringing along now. Remember to plug the multiple lead into the unit the right way round, as marked for the set. The plugs at the other end of the lead go to the key, line, earthing point, and the phone jack. Plug the microphone into the remote control unit. As soon as the cable is clamped to the unit, number three can get away and start laying out his line. Meanwhile, number four is adjusting the anode tap, and then he begins to tune up his transmitter. At the mast end, number one tunes the aerial unit. When they have both got a maximum reading, detachment A is ready to go on the air again after a break of five minutes, whereas detachment B is still not ready. Look out, the aerial unit's a delicate instrument. Number three of Detachment A arrives at the signal office and goes in to report. I brought the remote control, Sergeant. Where do you want it? Put it down there. Bring the lead in through there. Number three brings in his cable, laying it carefully out of the way so the trampling feet don't catch up in the cable and pull the control onto the floor. The twin connector is fitted to the appropriate terminals on the unit and then clamped to the end of the cable. The headphones and the microphone are connected and then number three is ready to test his line. Hello, Ted. Is the speech okay? Give me a buzz. Right out. Remote control okay, Sergeant. Very good. Meanwhile, Detachment B, not liking the look of the weather, have decided to put up their tent, which is all very well, but communications do come first. The electrician in Detachment A has camouflaged the truck and done the general maintenance and is now able to attend to his charging plant. The second pair of batteries are put on charge, ready for a quick changeover, and the charging rate is 10 amps. Now that Detachment A have completed all the essential jobs at their station, they can start to improve the amenities. With a little care, the tent can be erected over the set without interfering with the operator at work. The tent is first stayed out behind the operator to give him as much room as possible. The flaps of the tent have been tied back to let in the light, and that's the end of Detachment A's program, except that you must remember that we've been concerned only with the actual drill now. We would not, of course, be using a glaring white tent under active service conditions. But what about Detachment B? I want the signal master. Where the hell's my remote control? Well, hurry them up. 
Yes, indeed. The remote control is far more important than the interior decoration of the tent. But for the love of Mike, that set ought to have been inside, not outside. And so, as we bid farewell to Detachment B, don't forget that when getting your set out of the truck and onto the air again, every minute saved is worth its weight in, well, in rum ration. <laughs> Thank you.